something this morning, and I felt like in preparing this message that it would be a message that would help some people and some people did on some specific things. You know, sometimes when you look at life and you look at the sorrow and grief um, that, that comes, sometimes we wonder why certain things are happening, why certain things are happening to people, you know, whether it's disease, whether it's, um, you know, um, losing somebody, you know, all the things that we face in life that are deep and they're hard um, and they're tough, you know, um, sometimes people face an addiction, sometimes people have a marriage problem, you know, you're, you're facing a lot of grief and a lot of sorrow and a lot of things are going on around you, and sometimes you feel like you're in over your head. Sometimes you feel like you're struggling just to, you know, for your next breath of air, for your next day. You know, some people, it's not even to the point that they're ready to handle the whole day. They're just trying to handle the next moment. And so sometimes we struggle with those things that go on in life and that are hard to deal with. And so hopefully this morning, um, this sermon will help you with dealing some of that and understand why and when some of this stuff happens. Um, but I tell you what, God is always there. He is always there, just like you just so beautifully sang, Miss Monica. In the midst of it all, he is there. And so we want to praise him this morning. We want to honor him. So y'all stand with me in honor of reverence for reading God's word. On um, chapter 53, verse 1 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and um, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed him not. We esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, spitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Father, I pray and thank you, Lord. I thank you for being the gracious and good God that you are. I thank you, God, for bringing us all here this morning. I thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that I can depend on to be able to preach the word of God in surety, Lord, and the truth, God. I just pray that you would reveal your truth to us. And God, we thank you, God. We thank you for the men and women who died for the freedom we have. We thank you for the men and women who are fighting for that freedom right now. We thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord, for coming and setting the captives free. All of us that are saved and blood-bought in here today just want to thank you, God, for calling us to you, Lord, for um, just making us a new creature, Lord, just helping us to be born again. And God, I just pray you'd help us to live up to your standards, God to be a salt and a light in this world for your good and your glory. And that's, that's what we want this morning as I preach your word, God. I want you to be glorified. I want you to be magnified. I want you to be lifted up. In the name of Jesus, I pray and ask these things. Amen. When you look at these verses, these verses are kind of familiar. I mean, we've seen these verses before. Most of us that have been in church very long. And when you look at it, it's talking about, and this is Isaiah prophesying about the Lord Jesus Christ coming and prophesying about his life and the things that are going to happen to him. So whenever we look at this, you know, maybe the Old Testament folks that hadn't seen the crucifixion of Christ and, um, you know, didn't know what happened and was going to happen in the future, didn't quite understand how all this was going to work out. But we know that whenever it spoke about, you know, him taking our stripes, we know exactly what it's talking about. He took a beating for us. He took a, a lot of pain for us on the cross of Calvary. I mean, and before he went to the cross, he was beaten. And I'm going to tell you something. The Lord, I'm telling you right now, took and he carried. I love what it said in there. It said he carried our sorrows. He carried our grief. God carried our sorrows and he carried our grief. Where did he carry them to? He carried them to the cross of Calvary. He carried them throughout his life. He bore that burden that we couldn't bear. Um, whenever you look at um, when they were beat like he was, these stripes were administered by whipping the bare backs of prisoners whose hands and feet were bound, rendering them helpless. And... The phrase, by his stripes were healed, refers to the punishment Jesus suffered. The floggings and beatings with the fists were followed by his agonizing death on the cross. And he took upon himself all the sins of the world. And these whips that were used, they were like braided leather with pieces of pottery and glass and sharp stones on the ends. And it just tore the person's flesh apart. And each, each time that he was hit, it was just cruelty, man. And, you know, we picture this inhumane form of punishment, and it kind of we kind of pull back. And the physical pain and agony Jesus suffered were nothing compared to the mental anguish he suffered and his father turning his back on him because he died for our sins. He took our sins upon him. And so um, I'm telling you right now, he bore our griefs. He bore our sorrows. God did. He did that. So, and in other words, he came and lived as a man and he understands the grief and the sorrow that you're facing in life. And we all face grief and sorrow at some time, no matter how other people may view your life. Sometimes... Other people view your life as great and good and easy. And you know, like you've got it made because maybe you're living better than they are physically, socially, you know, economically. 
You know, I don't know. It, it may be anything that they look at and they say, you know, well, they got it made. But no matter how good you got it, so to speak, in this world ways, we still bear grief. We still bear sorrow. Every one of us face those things. And it is great to know, it is good to know that the Lord Jesus Christ bore our griefs and bore our sorrows and took them to the cross of Calvary. I'm telling you today, He understands when we pray to Him. He understands when we talk to Him just exactly what you're... He felt your exact pain. He felt your exact grief. He felt your exact sorrow. And He understands you completely. And He understands the whole situation going on around you. And God even understands the reason. A lot of times we want to understand that on this side of the grave. But there's a reason for what God is allowing to happen in your life. And in the lives of these people that I talked about, maybe a young child that's sick, or you know, a family looking at a child that has passed away, or you know, someone that has lived a good life, you think they'd be a good man, and they end up with cancer or something like that. Or someone dies in a tragic wreck. Or you know, um, your marriage is struggling. You're trying to do everything you can do to keep it together, and you just continue to struggle. I mean, when you look at these things in your life, and the things that you're facing, the grief and the sorrow you're facing, Jesus understands you completely. And I can tell you from personal experience, man, I have been beat up. I have been beat up. Let me tell you, there are two ways I want to talk about that we get beat up this morning. I know I'm not alone in this. I know you have been too. I get beat up on the outside by the curse. You say, what is it that wells on your body? What is it that causes all this hurt, all this pain that we see, all this physical suffering that we see in this life? What is it that causes us? Well, I want you to look back in Genesis chapter 3 at verse 16. I want you to listen to these words right here. And it will make sense of it all for you, hopefully. Unto the woman, he said, talking to Eve, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. He's talking to Adam and Eve, God is, after they um, partook of the forbidden fruit and they sinned against God and they'd fail. And whenever they fell into sin and brought sin into the world, this is God speaking to them about the consequences. He told them about the consequences before they did it, but they went and they did it anyway. But listen to what God told them. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You ladies know you hate the pain of childbirth, number one, and you know you hate God making the man the authority figure in your home. That's part of the curse. <laughs> and some of y'all say, Amen. But I'm telling you, you say, I don't like that. I don't like the way God set things up. Well, hey, it's part of the curse. But listen, it says, And then Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, I'm um, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Man, you're going to have sorrow. You're going to have grief throughout your life. And listen to what it's painstaking going out there making a living. I mean, I'm telling you, it's nerve wracking. It causes tremendous stress upon you. It's hard work. And work is hard because of the curse. Our life is hard because of the curse. Look what it says in verse 19. It says, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return into the ground, for out of it was taken. Um, thou taken for dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou, thou shalt return. So on the outside, I've been beaten up by the curse. And some of you that are older understand that greatly. You understand how your bodies break down. You understand how things don't stay good, how things don't stay great. You no longer feel like Superman like you did when you were 18 years old. You understand what I'm saying? If you stay up late one night, it's going to be hurting you the next morning, you know. And some of you, it may take you two or three weeks to recover from something you used to get over in one day. I'm telling you, the curse, it beats up on the outside of you. And most everybody has faced some kind of physical pain. Granted, some of you is much greater than others. Some of you have to deal with arthritis and the pain and things like that. Some of you have to deal with hurt, uh, hurts and pain from maybe an automobile accident. Some of you have some type of disease or debilitating thing going on in your life that breaks your body down and you're in pain that we just can't understand. And I get that, but we all face the curse. And the curse is what beats us up on the outside. And you say, why has this happened to me? Because of sin. Because of sin. We don't need to blame God. We need to look to God because God is the answer. Sin is the problem and sin is the cause. And it's at the root of our pain and it's at the root of our suffering. So whenever you think about the suffering that all mankind faces, then look at sin and look in the face of sin and learn to hate sin like God hates sin. Because God hates sin because God knows that sin has brought so much pain. Brought so much suffering, and like he told them in the garden, it was ultimately going to bring death. He said, surely you will die, and there's no doubt. I'm telling you, there's never been an exception to that rule. We have all died, every one of us. I'm telling you, you're going to die, you're going to face death. 
Only God can help us to overcome the grave and live in eternity with Him. And I'm telling you, thank God that one day as Christian people, we know that one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to remove the curse and He's going to rule the earth. And we're going to have renewed, glorified bodies that are fit for an eternity. We'll never have pain. We'll never have hurt. We'll never have to see one of our children or one of our friends or one of our neighbors suffer. I hate to see a little child in pain. I hate to see a little child hurt. But I tell you, one day God will have this place to where there will be no more hurts, there will be no more pains. God will remove the curse of sin. Amen? Because sin was brought into the world by one man. Through Adam's sin, all of mankind was born with a sin nature from then out. But through one man, the curse will be removed. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Thank God for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And I've been beat up on the outside by the curse, but I've been beat up on the inside even worse. By something even worse, by sin. My soul was tormented by my sin. Don't you understand that? The torment that you go through on the inside because of sin? Listen to me. I was tormented by the source of sin. Psalm 51 4 says this Against thee, this is David speaking to God. And when he spoke to God, he said this He said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sin, the sin, my sinful nature is where sin comes from. I'm telling you today, my sin comes from me. I had to look dead in the mirror and I had to blame myself for the things that I do. You hear what I'm saying? The devil ain't made me do it. My circumstances ain't made me do it. Whenever I face the stone cold hard facts that God has told me in the truth of His Word, then in my sin, my sin is my fault. It was my choice. It was my doings. I know I was born with that sin nature, but I chose to commit those sins. I chose to do wrong in the eyes of God. And so the source of my sin brings me torment. Because when I look in the mirror, I know that the pain that I'm suffering from those sins was caused by me. I chose to do some of those things that I had to live with for the rest of my life. Don't you understand? Don't, don't you know that in this building today, there's some people that their sins are still haunting them? The things they chose to do are still chasing them? I'm telling you, chasing them like a good hound dog. You hear what I'm saying? They're chasing them. Everywhere they go when they lay down at night, they think about the sins they committed and some of the things that people know about and sometimes even worse, some of the things that people don't know about that you did. They chase you and they haunt you. They haunt you when you read the Bible. They haunt you day in and day out when you go and you live. They haunt you when you walk in the doors of the church and make you feel so unworthy because you chose to do those sins and you're the source of that sin, I'm telling you today. Another thing that torments my soul is the side of sin. And Psalm 51.3 says this, My sin is ever before me. King David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and everywhere he went he couldn't get out of his mind that he'd sinned against Almighty God. Oh, let me tell you something. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible sight to see the first time that you're convicted of your sins, and through the Word of God, God teaches you that you um, have sinned something wrong, it's a terrible sight to look at a holy God and know how sinful and dirty you are as a sinner who's never been forgiven of your sins, someone who's never been saved, but let me tell you something else that'll torment your soul. Christian people already saved when you go out and sin and you think about the things you've done, not as a lost man anymore, but as a saved man. Man, and it's just like it's before you, everywhere you go, you think, how could I be a child of God and do this? How could I be a child of God and do that? And it just torments your soul, man. It's a source of torment for you, the side of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen to me. And not only am I tormented by the source of the sin, the side of the sin, but also the strength of sin. Romans 7.15, Paul said this, For that which I do, I allow not. He said, What I want to do for God, I don't do. And he said, For what I would, that, I do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. The strength of sin. Sin is so strong. And those sins that you struggle with, you know the ones I'm talking about. I don't know what they are for every individual. I really don't. But you know what the things are you struggle with constantly and consistently that you're going to struggle with the rest of your life. And you hate them. You hate them. You hate that sin. You hate it. You got a deep, deep, deeper and deep hatred for that sin. But you know how it is, man. You try, and you get straight, and then all of a sudden, bam, you're right back in the same hole. You know what I mean? It's like on a muddy road, and those deep ruts are already there. You try to ride up out of the ruts, but it just keeps getting pulled down in them. Those deep-seated sins you hate with a deep, deep, Deeper than deep hatred. 
One of the greatest men of God that ever lived was Paul who wrote those words. One of the strongest men of God that ever lived. One of the most used men of God that ever lived. One of the, I'm telling you right now, brightest, most brilliant theologians that ever lived penned those words. He said, the things that I hate, I end up doing. I'm telling you right now, the strength of sin. And then the last point on that is, another thing that torments me is the sum of sin. Is that I could never make up for it. Listen to what it says in Romans 7, verse 11. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Those sins you commit, they just kill your testimony if you're saved. They just kill your soul if you're lost. And the deadness and darkness is so deep. And sometimes we smile and put on a face and we act like everything's okay. But deep down in those places, nobody else sees. You know it's lurking there. You know that one day, some of you in here today may have never been saved. You may have never given your life to God. You know that one day, you might not have submitted to God, but you believe what the preacher's saying true. You believe that the um, wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's the price you've got to pay. That's the sum. That's the amount that you've got to pay for your sins. If you walk out of this world on your own, apart from Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you know, you sowed those seeds of iniquity. You sowed those seeds of sin. And you know it's been raining, and one day the crop's going to come up. Maybe some of you done been reaping what you sowed. There's some of sin. Man, it's no fun. The devil, the devil never tells you all the repercussions. He only tells you the good part. Your buddies never tell you all the repercussions. They only tell you the good part. You know what I'm saying? Your, your flesh, you, on the inside, your desires, they never look at the repercussions. They just look at the good parts. But then when you look at the sum of sin, and you see, you, man, some of you may have been trying to do more good than you did bad to make right with God. You can't do that. It won't get you anywhere. You know, there's no way to pay for your sins. There's no way. You can never burn long enough. You can never do good. Do enough good to make up for it. There's not one thing you could do to make up for those sins. The price for your sin is higher than any man can pay. I'm telling you, the sum of sin. I'm telling you, I've been beat down, but thank you. Hey, thank God that we don't just get left beat up if we turn to Jesus Christ. I've been beat up, but I tell you what else, I've been bound up. Listen to these words he said in Isaiah. He said, he said, listen, he is despising men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And listen, listen to me now, a man of sorrow. You, that's how he's describing Jesus. He could have described him any way he wanted to. He was a man of power. Think about it. He had more power than any man lived on the face of the earth. He's a man of perfection. He walked and lived the perfect sinless life. I tell you, he could have called him a man of perfection. I'm telling you right now, he could have called him a man of holiness, a man of righteousness, a man of wisdom. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a man of love, a man of grace, a man of mercy. But the way God led Isaiah to describe the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was going to come, he was going to be depicted, he was going to be seen as a man of sorrow. Everywhere he went, man, he could get away from men, but he could never get away from his sorrows. He could never get away from the grief. He knew where he was headed. He knew what was coming. I mean, he went and knelt down in the garden, and as he prayed, he prayed so hard. He grieved so hard over what he was going to face that drops of blood fell from his forehead. The Lord Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows. But listen what he did. He did it for a reason. He did it for a reason. And acquainted with grief, and we hid it as were faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. I'm going to tell you today, I want to read you something. I want to read you something. Here's the definition of a broken heart. Here's the definition of a broken heart. Metaphorically, it's an emotional and spiritual aching in your soul that happens when you're deeply disappointed or grieved over a circumstance. And I'm going to tell you a circumstance that all of us can grieve over this morning. All of us can agree that facing each and every one of us is sin. That's the circumstance we're all in is sin. That we're facing this morning that grieves our soul, that grieves our heart. But thank God for Jesus Christ. He didn't leave me beat up. He come and bound me up. Listen to what I mean by that. Psalms 147.3. He healeth the broken in heart and he bindeth up their wounds. You see what I'm saying? My grieving, hurting, beat up, beat down, tore up from the floor up soul. God came along. Jesus Christ came along. And through the power of His blood, He took that healing power of the blood of Jesus Christ and covered my sins, made my hurts, 
helped me, uplifted me, took away my grief and my sorrow, replaced it with joy, everlasting joy that the devil can't take away, that the world can't mess with, that my circumstances won't take away, that I can depend on, that I can look to. And even in the times when I fail and I fall, I can look to God and have joy in my heart to know I've got a Father in Heaven that loves me. And even when I'm broken hearted over my own sin and the sins of other people, I can look to God and Him help and uplift my broken heart. Even when I see the pain and suffering of others and it grieves me so deeply my stomach hurts and my body aches and I can't sleep at night, I know that God can help my broken heart and help the broken heart of those people because I serve a God with a healing power that not only can heal you physically one day with a new glorified body that can heal your soul from the torments of sin, heal your soul from the torments of grief and sorrow. He carried those burdens to the cross and they nailed it down and it stayed right there. And I'm telling you today, if you'll accept the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll heal your broken heart. He'll uplift your broken soul and the struggles you're struggling with that nobody even sees. The Lord God Almighty will reach down Himself. He won't send anybody else. He won't leave it to anybody else. He'll come Himself and He'll heal your broken heart this morning. He'll bring it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, you're broken hearted this morning. I'm telling you, listen to all these words. Listen to these verses. They're so encouraging. Psalm 73 says, My flesh and my heart faileth. Sometimes I fail. Everything in me fails. Sometimes my heart fails. Sometimes my faith fails me. But listen to what it says. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Isaiah said in chapter 41, He said, Fear thou not. I'm telling you, if you're afraid today, don't be afraid. Listen to what God said. For I am with thee. He said, For I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I praise God this morning that Jesus Christ is my God. I thank God I don't look to some man-made God. I thank the, uh, the Lord this morning I look to the one true God. I thank the, the Lord this morning that He's my God, the one I can look to and know can help me this morning. He says, I will strengthen thee. Listen to me this morning. Isaiah wrote these words down in the Word of God. So it's a promise from God that God will strengthen you. When your strength fails you, when your heart fails you, God will come along and He'll uplift you and He'll strengthen you. He'll help you to make it through things you never thought you could walk through. I'm telling you, God can do it. Listen to us. He says, I will help thee. You need help this morning? God, He would help you. He would help you. He may not change the circumstances, but He'll uplift you and He'll strengthen you so you can walk through the middle of them. And He said, I will uphold thee with the right hand out of my righteousness. That's His hand of power. God said, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you're facing. He's got the power to uphold you this morning. He's got the power if you'll place yourself in the hand of God to keep you up, to keep you from falling, to pick you up when you're down. I'm telling you, God can do it. Amen? Amen. Listen, Isaiah and the psalmist weren't the only ones that said something about it. Matthew recorded these words from the Lord Jesus. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. He said, Take, unto, um, you, uh, take upon you my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, God's talking to you this morning. I'm telling you, there's some folks that needed to hear that this morning. You're laboring and you're burdened down. I'm telling you, it's just like pulling teeth to just get up in the morning. You don't want to face the world. You want to go off in some hole and just sit there in the dark. But God said that if you're burdened down, if you're laboring to even live, to come unto Him, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Listen, John even said something about it in chapter 14. He recorded some more words of the Lord. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth. See, the world wants to give you things that give you momentary peace. But with peace that God gives you, it'll last forever. It'll make it through anything. It's a different kind of peace. It ain't that same kind of temporary fix. I'm telling you right now, it ain't just something that you hit and it's gone in the morning. You hear what I'm saying? It ain't something you hit tonight and you're feeling good and you wake up with a headache tomorrow. I know how that feels. Amen. Amen. I thank God that when I wake up with a headache now, I ain't hung over at least. And I'm telling you, I was so bound by it. I, I mean, I don't look down upon anybody. Man, it, it is strong, son. I would say every morning when I woke up from a drunk the night before. And I stay out drinking about 3 in the morning. And I get up, I'd still probably be about half drunk when I woke up at 7 to go to work. My boss man had a bag of peppermints I'd have to eat because he said I smelled like a brewery. And I'd show up to work and I'd beat on them tires out in that hot sun hung over as I could be, and I'd say, you know what I mean, old drunk's prayer. God help me make it through the day, and I won't ever drink again. But boy, about 4 o'clock in the evening, boy, when the Bud Light sure started looking good. You know, and then there I was again. I was trapped, man. I'm telling you, I was trapped. The next morning, the same thing. But what God said, it wasn't something temporary. 
It wasn't something, I mean, just, that just lasted a moment and was gone. It wasn't something that was, just killed the pain. What God wants to give you is a permanent solution that you can depend on for eternity. He said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen? Listen to what he said. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God said that if you feel weak this morning like you, you can't do it on your own, he said his strength is made perfect. In other words, his, his strength can come to complete fruition in your life, in the middle of your weakness. When you get to the point where you figure out I can't do it on my own, then you're right in the perfect place this morning for God to come in and to do it for you. Amen? Listen to what he said in Psalm 55, 22. He said, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Psalm 107. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. You know what keeps some of us in here this morning from crying out to God? I mean, you're in trouble, and you know you're in trouble. You might know your marriage is in trouble. You might know your kid's in trouble. You might know your job's in trouble. You might know your finances are in trouble. You know what keeps us from calling out to God? Pride. Pride. This was a cry. This was a, this was a cry of humility, man. This is a cry from someone who ain't got nowhere else to go. Ain't got nowhere else to turn. And it says he brought them, in verse 14, out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands and sun. Don't you want that this morning? Ain't you tired of being a servant to sin? The devil's a hard taskmaster, brother. Ain't you tired of being bound down by it? Ain't you tired of answering to him? See, you think you're your own master, but you're just fooling yourself. You're either one or the other. You're either God's or the devil's. The thing he wants you to do is think you're pulling all the strings. You'll always be happy with that. Till that seed starts growing. You start reaping what you sown. And he don't want to help you no more. And those friends that help you pile on up in there, they ain't nowhere to be found. It's just you and God. Listen to what First Peter says, chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Who himself, his own self, bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we're healed. You want to be healed this morning? You want to be truly whole? There's only one place to go, and that's the cross. That's to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's to him. That's the only way you can truly be healed this morning. I want to read you a couple of things that Charles Spurgeon said. He said, He is a man with hands full of blessing, eyes wet with tears of pity, lips overflowing with love, and a heart melting with tenderness. See the gash in his side? Through that wound there's a highway to his heart. This is what Oswald Chambers closed. And this, this is the invitation right here. I'm telling you, think about these words I'm fixing to read to you. Just let them sink in. He said, leave the broken, irreversible past in God's hands. You hear that? Leave the broken, irreversible past in God's hands. There's some of you in here this morning, the thing that's chasing you is your past. And you can't change it. You know there's nothing you can do about it. He said, leave it in the past. He said, put it in God's hands. So you don't want to bring your past to God because you're afraid God won't have you because of your past. But what really is true is that God knows your past, God knows your future, God knows your present. And God loves you in the midst of it all. And He wants you to bring it to Him 